We have about half an hour for a discussion. Let me remind you all to say who you are um, when you speak. Um, we'll take a couple of rounds and maybe since we do have a question coming from a, um, somebody following the discussion online, we'll give him precedence uh, to kick off the discussion. This is from Albert Van Zyl from the IBP, but based in South Africa, who has a question for Neil, saying that the preconditions for budget reform that you listed could be ambitious in many countries, and where do you start? Uh, where to start when these cannot be met? Take let's, take a, let's take a couple of more. Um, there's one here and one here. Good morning. First of all, I am very happy to be one of you, and I, I will translate for yes. my colleague. No, no, it works. It's working. You can just say who you are. Thank you. Myself? Both of you. <laughs> okay. My, this is my colleague, Mr. Ali, Deputy Minister Assistant yeah. for Budget, Republic of Yemen, Ministry of Finance. Myself, Yusuf Radai. Just as a budget specialist and uh, director, external finance relations. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I think there are too much talk about the BFM. And we have a long experience in public financial management reform in, 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 in the Republic of Yemen. And I think that we have started in the reform of BFM 2005, and there is one gentleman, he is, he is participated here, Richard Allen, that have visited our country from time to another. There is one core discussion in this aspect. Yet we have to look for I mean, the structural reforms in the BFM. If the BFM reforms, just to take care of the goal of Located better, I mean, for budget. Just that, that, that come to develop and uh, help uh, support the development. But there are some, I mean, problems in some aspects. How can we address some structure, some reforms in the in the budget structures? Okay. If, you, if we are taking an example, just our country, that we are not be able to finalize the reforms in the BFM, that reflects in the budget reforms itself. That's what I would like to introduce and participate beside all the presentations we have here yes. today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's one here. Um, my name is Chola Chabra from uh, Zambia. I'm not very sure whether it's a question or, or a comment, but then maybe the gentleman from South Africa could comment. Um, Often, uh, we, uh, it looks like we get somewhat preoccupied with undertaking reforms. But I think, in my view, the missing link has been the so what question. At the end of the day, we need to see the real outcomes. And I've not heard much being talked about the impact, the intended beneficiaries. And the, one of the key components is the strong management for development results that has been lacking. Since morning, I think there's been no strong reference to this, except in one slide that I saw. And if we're just doing reforms for the sake of fulfilling the reform agenda, <coughs> and I think we may be missing the point. That is one point. The other aspect is the <coughs> congestion of reforms. There are too many reform agendas that are competing, almost uh, falling over each other. 
I can assure you before we finish the PFM reforms, there's another being, I mean, born somewhere in Washington. This is creating a whole lot of confusion. Can we do that which is right with a focus on beneficiaries rather than doing res reforms for the sake of satisfying certain agendas? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a couple of more. Please be brief so more people have a chance to speak. Yes, Ed. Ed Hedger, ODI. Um, I think this debate is is really interesting in terms of the sorts of consensus or the, the multiple consensus it reveals. And I'm, I'm struck for the two or three presentations that almost we seem to have a, a dilemma now around some of these uh, relatively advanced, relatively formal measures. Um, there is a consensus in this room and elsewhere that whether it be program-based budgeting, medium-term expenditure frameworks, they have a, a poor track record, they don't work, they suck in scarce capacity, they're misleading in terms of what they actually deliver versus what they promise. Um, and I think there is a, an assumption that they are almost exclusively a externally imposed. At the same time, 15 years of hard work and hard persuasion also seem to have succeeded in that there's also quite a lot of demand for these things. Um, there are countries, in the sense that that argument has been won, and whether it is in Cadbury seminars or in rooms of ministries of finance in as you can recall, in Nepal or Liberia, there is what seems to be some, some sort of genuine demand for that. Given that we are also trying to be demand-driven, we're trying to be responsive, and sovereignty is, is key, I think there is this question about what do we do about this. Um, and it's not, I think it's not sort of straightforward, but a sort of couple of thoughts of what you might conclude from that. I mean, one could be that that, that demand, so-called, is in itself a little bit disingenuous. It recognises that there are benefits and rewards that accrue from replicating and, and creating those, those sort of um, reform impressions. Um, or you could conclude that there is a genuine amount of sincerity around that. There's persuasion that these reforms will actually fix a certain set of problems underlying that. And in that lies what might be described as, as maybe some, some naivety about the likely effectiveness or even the likely compatibility of those reforms with the sorts of results. So, my sort of reflection, I suppose, my sort of comment or, or question back for the, the panel to discuss is, is then what do we, what do, we do about that? Do we say that, um, in some extent, what, what's in a name, it may be a misrepresentation of what was intended, but underlying that, maybe there is an objective that is important and that you disregard to some extent um, the, 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 the misuse of the terminology and actually pursue the objective and use that as a mechanism to, to, to sort of focus on the objectives. Or alternatively, we follow this sort of experimenting approach and we say there's genuinely some learning to be had through approaching this and if there's some demand. So I, I put that back to the panel and saying, is, is there something positive we could take out of what, for me, seems this, this apparent dilemma at the moment of, of these conflicting two sets of consensus, as I would perhaps characterise it? Great. It seems like a, a good time to pause and get some answers. So we talked about too much PFM and not enough reflections on the structural reforms that happen within the budget process and perhaps related to that the point about too many reform agenda being pursued. Um, the so what questions are not enough on outcome and outputs um, and this issue is about the extent to which um, we, can, we should assume that some of these agendas that we no longer seem to like are externally imposed rather than internally driven and when there is a genuine demand what we do about it and let me add that one last from Tranvera Lipovica who's a program manager with NDI in Kosovo who's asking about gender budgeting and is that something that developing countries pay attention to any success stories and examples to note a lot to choose from who wants to Can I do first get going? yeah you have the first uh, to say a question to from, from Albert that, yeah. that ask um, about the preconditions the, yeah, for budget um, reform I, I think where, where countries should be starting is to identify what the problem is that they, that they want to solve. Um, the preconditions that I listed were preconditions specific to, 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 to countries that are thinking about um, implementing uh, performance and program-based program -based budgeting. Um, but there may be, um, in understanding the problem, um, a decision that is taken by a country that maybe what reform we should be taking on is a reform to improve the accounting for inputs. 
um, and, and once um, accounting for inputs are, are, are improved, that you can then start to move to um, better accounting for outputs and, and, and maybe move along to looking at um, whether you've achieved your, 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 desired, your desired outcomes. Um, so I, I don't think that there's, 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 there's any kind of, or would wish to want to put across any kind of best practice as to where you're going to start. Um, um, I think it's about a, a, a country finding, finding a way to agree on um, what the problems are and to reach that agreement with the technical assistance that they're going to receive, um, make the agreement with the donors that are going to support them in, in this regard, and to, and, and to make that um, an iterative process um, where you also adapt as you, as you go along, um, because I don't think many of these processes necessarily follow a, a linear a, a, a linear line in, in, in terms of that your problem starts here and this is going to be the next step and the next step and the next step towards your towards your solution. Uh, uh, countries that, 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 that may solve the problem of, 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 of um, accounting for inputs, once they get that right, may decide that, well, maybe we don't need program budgeting. Mm. No, no, probably, probably just, just, just very briefly. I think, I think there are three, three issues that, that touch upon. But let me, let me, let me first start with, with one of the comments that, that Joaquin made about the de facto versus the jury. Uh, just making sure that you know, I, I agree completely with what you know you were saying about that the, the role that the laws have and, and, and which is extremely important, uh, mainly because sometimes the laws can generate the, the environment for good things to happen. You know, and I think, I think again. For example, the case of the fiscal responsibility law in Brazil is a, is a very good example in which the law creates the incentives and the conditions and the and, and the playing field in which all of the other political incentives that will you know were being generated by you know the, the, the executives now thinking about fiscal responsibility as the as the main objective uh, and the and the and the governors playing a different role now in the new political environment. Uh, uh, we're, we're having so, so I think I think clearly there are many many laws that have you know a, a very important role in 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 how to how to improve things, um, but also also I think I think the, the point that you were making about about the you know bringing you know paying people on time and and, and stuff is very much related to the to the question that the gentleman from Zambia have, and somehow related also what what Ed was saying about. Uh, about you know how how to deal with demand driven and stuff and and this is interesting because sometimes we tend to evaluate countries uh, in you know against these objective indicators you know and rank them etc uh, and a lot of time we are we are we are doing a big service you know to to this country in putting things in black and white and and, and seeing but sometimes also we we may generate pressure pressure to do reforms where we don't need those reforms yet you know and and, and people may see themselves you know, very low in these in, in these indicators are probably you know have have the this demand for doing that reform, even though they still haven't been able to pay their their, their teachers on time. So so I think we also have to put you know to put some of our efforts in, in perspective, uh, uh, in and, and help countries realize you know what what are the orders uh, in which we have to to to, uh, to attack these processes no and, and so forth. Thank you. Uh, I have a brief question. Uh, we, need, we, need, we need to use the uh, mic. Sorry, sorry. Hold on a second. We need you to use the mic. Can you Thank be you. brief so we can go back Thank to you. other people have a comment? Okay. Uh, you have uh, prescribed for the general uh, equilibrium perspective mm -hmm. in your model. Mm -hmm. And do general equilibrium really uh, happens in the real life? Sure. Uh, well, Real life is a general equilibrium uh, in, in, in a sense that in a sense that the basically what, what is happening in the budget process is that we are all you know coming into into this into this game each one of us with with you know with, with our own incentives and the result reflects reflects this and, and and the problem is that sometimes affecting some some levers of this project of, of this process will not change the overall that, that's what I'm trying to say that's I know and, and in, in the pictures I was I was I was showing. The fact that the budget process is, is this huge thing, and this you know, and, and it takes place in, in so many different arenas and so, so over over such a long time. The fact that sometimes we restrict about the approval process, so we we restrict the the legislature about what they can do or they cannot do during the approval process, 
we are still leaving some other levers open in which then what happens, you know, most you know, most of the things happen during the, the execution process. So, so what, I, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we need to take this in a holistic general equilibrium per perspective and not thinking that, you know, if we change some part of the process, then everything will fall, will fall in, in place. Okay, let me give the opportunity to Jan and Joachim to respond to some of the questions that we've oh, thus far. I, I, I would like to respond to, to the observations that there are too many reform agenda and that there is a confusion on the beneficiary side about that, and also whether um, the, the, the program budgeting, medium term budgeting, whether the demand is genuine or, or, or not, um, or is it externally imposed? I would say the answer to that is uh, that, that we really have to pay attention to developing internal capacity uh, of, of countries. And one, one uh, I would like to quote uh, Central Bank Governor uh, of, of Albania regarding this. Uh, he said, institutions are of urgent need of technical experts who are independent thinkers, proud of what they do, and who understand the consequences of their action. By that, I think you, you then have an answer to both challenges, because its beneficiaries is those in countries that have to decide among priorities. If they don't have capacity, it is uh, given that there will be too many reform agenda agendas or that they wouldn't be sure you know, how, how, to, how to deal with program budgeting or medium term budgeting. But if they have the internal capacity to actually make judgments, then, then it will work. And uh, to, to answer, I, I think it's, uh, it's a necessity actually to, to, to um, uh, uh, um, <coughs> address program budgeting and medium term budgeting, but in a, in a, in a broader sense, uh, taking into consideration also the soft areas that I was mentioning, the coordination, the cooperation, the leadership, et cetera. Thank you. You're okay. You want to add something else? Yeah. Maybe just two quick reactions so Carlos was I, I like what you said about uh, the role of uh, indices and so on and how people get attracted attracted to certain institutional reforms because they s would like to see their their countries move up in some rankings and of course I'm, I'm uh, guilty here as well I've also built indices so um, but and, and then again, I was thinking about Per Molander, for example, was a prime example of, you know, of the Swedish reforms where actually someone sat down, took an index, someone had done, it, it didn't have Sweden in it, calculated the score for Sweden, they said, oh, we look, hor we look terrible, and showed it to the politicians and said, here, we look like Italy on this ranking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it was at the time. Only Italy has worse budget institutions in Europe. Uh, we must do something, and and people did something. So, on the one hand, okay. I completely Ready? agree, um, but um, maybe also, so it's a call for more intelligent indices. Maybe rather than to say don't do indices, I'm I'm actually a big fan of indices. And okay. if I think of the Open Budget Index, you know, it's a fantastic product, and uh, I'd okay. like pe more countries to strive to improve their ranking on the Open Budget Index for sure. But um, you know, we need to think harder about what kinds of indices we build and, and how we interpret them as mm -hmm. well. Very briefly uh, about uh, the, the comment from Zambia, which I think is, yes, of course, that, that this kind of driving should be driving reforms. You know, how do we actually, what does it mean? How does it make lives of people better in some kind of way? I, I just sometimes feel that PFM is overburdened with these questions. So these are things, you know, you can, you don't need to take care of in annual budgets. If I think of Europe at the moment and big debates uh, uh, around education reform are completely uh, 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 taking place outside annual budget decisions. You know, they're driven by OECD rankings. There's a program of international student assessments that has you know, prompted a lot of countries to rethink again what they do about education. And at some point, maybe this will filter into into budget allocations in some kind of way, but it's not necessarily through the annual budget process that we need to do all, think about all these things that have to do with outcomes and, and, and outputs. Of course, budgets need to align, but the budget process itself is not necessarily the, the best place to, to have those debates, I think. Okay, um, we started a bit late, so let's assume we can take about five 
we're 10 minutes into the lunch break, so let's do another quick round. We start again with uh, a question from our online audience. Soren Jensen is a consultant at the IBP and IPA based in London, who has a question for Carlos. Um, he agrees with you that reforms cannot be externally imposed, but wonders whether there is scope for greater role to be played by dom CSOs domestically. There is Philip and Paolo and then Simon and one here, and then we're probably need to stop. Um, thank you, Marta. I wanted to pick up on one of the points that, that Carlos made that I think is maybe a little bit of an understatement in what a challenge that might pose. Carlos, you were saying that in, in, in from your point of view, Capacity is something that is endogenous to the political process. So essentially, if some, it's basically to a lay person like myself that sounds as though you're saying capacity is something like a muscle. If you if you need to do a certain thing and you exercise it, then the capacity will grow. But on the other hand, if you just put like a steroid shot into your arm and then you don't use it, you just look like an basically you look like an <laughs> idiot. Um, <laughs> the the question for me then would be. You, you hear a lot, a lot of discussion internationally about, for instance, nobody is paying attention to legislatures in the, in the budget process. Let's strengthen legislative budget offices. Nobody is reading audit reports and nobody is paying enough attention to external accountability and external scrutiny. Let's strengthen the supreme auditor. Let's, let's increase the capacity in these institutions and then the function will follow. According, uh, Carlos, maybe I'm misstating you or I'm building you up a little bit as a straw man here, but is that the wrong way to go then? Mm. I'm, I'm hoping that maybe I can tempt your argument a little bit out of, uh, out of his position and, and I'm sure you have something to say about that. Thanks, uh, uh, Paolo Derencio from IBP again. It seems like all of my colleagues are online and asking questions as well. Um, I wanted to pick up on a point that uh, Joachim made on uh, indices and indicators. There's a, there's a question in the, in the booklet about some of the questions that are meant to guide this session on is there an implementation gap in budgeting and what would be the indicators to measure and tackle it? And it seems to me that there's a very useful discussion to be had there. Moving away from the types of indicators that we tend to use in PFM, and of course I'm not going to talk about the Open Budget Index because uh, Joachim has, has already said the wonderful things about it. But you know, if you think about uh, many of the PFA indicators tend to measure form rather than function. And so when we talk about does a country have an MTEF, does a country have performance-based budgeting, and so on and so forth, we're really uh, measuring form rather than function. So how do we move away from that and how do we focus on other things that are the things that we care about. So uh, Carlos was using that beautiful graphic on you know, fiscal rule, fiscal responsibility legislation and, and, and fiscal deficits or measures of, of fiscal balance. Maybe we shouldn't be looking at whether a country has a fiscal rule or a fiscal responsibility law. We should just simply be looking at the fiscal balance and whether it's managing to balance its budget. You know, we should be looking at whether there's a lot of uh, incongruence or differences between what was originally approved and what was finally executed rather than any other aspect of form. And we should be looking at whether governments pay salaries on time and whether they can do procurement of goods and services in, a, in an effective manner and whether they can you know, build schools and, and sort of kind of moving it onto the kinds of things that we want budgets to do rather than the, the, the ways in which budgets uh, should look like. And I, I, th I think that's a very important conversation that needs to be had. Simon, and then one last one here at the front. Hi, it's um, Simon McGill. I'm based here at ODI. It's three reflections and then a suggestion. Um, I've been studying the conference brochure, and I noticed that the commonality on the pictures on the front page, the technology on the front page, I think three of the people on that desk have a stapler. So. It seems to be that's the height of their technology they have available to them. So I've got a phrase like start with a stapler as a starting point. That's one reflection. Second reflection is my wife is a community worker. and One of the things that they are looking at is something called asset-based community development. It's ABCD, which has got quite a nice acronym. But it's starting with the, the, the assets that you have, the, the qualities you have. Um, and then the third, the third consensus point is that I think many of the speakers, there's a consensus around politics, 
institutions and capacity building. And my, I suppose my suggestion is I wonder whether looking back over 15 years of technical assistance provided by many <coughs> donor agencies, I think if you go back 15 years, there was much more evidence of on-the-ground presence in many countries by donor agencies. We don't do that anymore so much, but I wonder if in terms of the needing to work with people, working them through experiences, taking them from where they are, using their assets and their resources, we need to look more carefully at our models of assistance. Thanks. The last question is here at the front. Okay, we have the last two. Can you please be both very, very brief so we can give a chance to Sure. I'll be, well, since Paolo preempted pretty much what I had to say on the indicator, so I'll, <laughs> I'll skip on that. Uh, I like very much the emphasis that uh, Joachim and Jan has put on the HR. And I'd like to turn a little bit what Joachim said. He said, we wish we had people that were capable of running PFM systems. I wish we had people who can actually design PFM systems that make sense, because we rely too much on kind of private sector technology on the assumption that these technologies and methodologies actually work in the private sector, and they don't, uh, or at least not to, to the extent that we, that we expect. So again, this is, is an area that's been under-researched, and, and going back to the fact that, that reforms, as our friend from Zambia said, they run in parallel. We do PFN reforms, we don't look at EHR, we don't look at broader public administration, we don't look at in government and all these things. So again, uh, some reaction here in, in, in your experience where there's, there's, there's scope to bring these things a little bit more closer together so we can actually try to achieve and then measure more efficiently and effectively, as Pyro will say, with the better new generation of indicators for us. Okay. The very last question, please brief, and then I'll give two minutes since the panel uh, th Thank you. Um, Anand Rajaram from the World Bank. I cover governance and public management in the Africa region. Um, uh, when Antoinette began this morning by talking about uh, the importance of politics, uh, I was thinking, well, exactly how do we operationalize that? I actually believe that's correct. Uh, but then this discussion, this panel essentially seemed to reiterate a lot of what we know, which is that uh, you know the technical aspects of it, we have made mistakes. Getting the basics right is, is still important. Uh, but the, the chart that Jana put up, and uh, in a way also what Carlos referred to, the general equilibrium, the chart that showed uh, the technical tip, where we tend to focus and do a lot of our work. But underlying that chart really is a lot of uh, culture, politics, uh, governance, all of that. So if we are really saying that's really what we should be understanding much better, and if we understood that much better, perhaps we wouldn't do what uh, my colleague from Zambia was talking about, which is to recommend things that are inappropriate for that context. But then the, what's the takeaway message? Should we really be thinking about if we understand the politics? And let's stress test that. If you're really dealing with a per, sort of patronage-based government, the objective function of the politician is quite different. And we assume that it's about service delivery. It's about getting developmental outcomes. There's a contradiction there. And how do we resolve that contradiction? If we're going to do incentive-compatible reforms, how do we think about that challenge? I think we need to go deeper into that area. I think we, there's a certain degree of consensus at the top. As you go deeper into this and think about what's the nature of the bureaucracy, why is it the way it is, what's the, what is it about the politics that drives it, I think we might get to the heart of the matter. So I would welcome a conversation on that aspect of the problem, the politics, and how it shapes it. If, the, if we take that seriously, one of the conclusions might well be that all we should be thinking about is where are the stress points where an external agent could bring about some kind of a catalytic change, either through information or through some knowledge, as, Anna, as Antoinette was suggesting. Great, thank you. Sounds like politics will be the topic at lunch. Um, let me start with Carlos, because he had a couple of direct questions to you from, uh, from Philip and from Soren. Uh, yes, uh, very, very interesting question. Actually, you know, there, there is, I think there was more insight coming from that side of the table than, than f at least from my microphone. Uh, I, I will not talk about the, the indicators. I love indicators. You know, I use them all, all the time. That's you know, that it, it pay, that's what pays me. So, so, and, and but I think I think Paolo answered answer, answer the question better than I. Uh, let me let me let me probably probably just one one question will summarize the, the, the three main things that I I have been asked. One is you know what is the role for external actors, how to work on, on certain on certain areas, uh, and I think I think the last the last point uh, from from my colleague by, by the World Bank, basically. 
uh, I think I think I think there is a huge role for us. L- not probably probably I, I I you know I was not clear uh, on, on my presentation. I think I think there are a lot of things that we we, we can do. Probably we just have you know not been looking at the right at the right place. And and and, and related to to Philip's question. Uh, we have done a lot of what you're saying, you know, doing a lot of, you know, legisl- legislative strengthening, etc. Uh, but we have not been successful. Actually, the IDB has moved away. That was one, one of the areas in which the IDB used to work the most. And now it's almost, you know, a, a no-no, okay, doing this legislative strengthening, you know, because we created plenty of CBOs. We, we, we gave tons of money to, to, to budget committees. Uh, and then you know all of these things basically disappear o- over time when they are not when they are not working. So, but but on the other hand, you know, and, and I ha- I'm writing a couple of papers on the institutionalization of Congress. There are many things that we can do in order to strengthen Congress, and and, and there are many many places in which we can we can enter in order to make uh, Congress a, a, a more relevant place. Um, because once once you make Congress a relevant place. Uh, you can start doing things, and, and if we think about the type of things we we have been doing, and you know, I, I have been very active on the budget institutions literature. Basically, at some point, we decided if we want fiscal sustainability, we need to take away as you know as many responsibility from the legislator as we can. Uh, so we we have been basically telling legislators, well, look, the budget is not an area in which you have nothing to say. So. How can we expect then legislators <coughs> to invest in their capacities in the budget process if we are telling them that they shouldn't be involved in that in that process? So, so we, we have been we have been leading, and but we can we, we can talk uh, about it more because, for example, in many countries we have patronage politics because we don't have a good budget process, uh, uh, and that's the way the way no no but but it's but, but it's interesting because I, I can give you a specific example of, of a country in which because the government does not have. <laughs> Tokens of exchange. It doesn't have a good budget process in which to give, you know, a long-term, uh, generally long-term agreement. Then what they can do, basically, give positions in the in the, in the public administration because that's the only thing that is long-term. Uh, because they don't have so so we can we can work both both ways and and, and interact with each other. Okay, Yana, I will have to ask you to be all a bit brief and maybe uh, pick one of the questions. Yeah, the the question is what do what can we do about. Uh, uh, bringing the HR topic yes. more into into the conversation. Uh, from from my perspective, is uh, that we start cooperating with 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 those institutions that address public administration issues in a broader sense. Uh, what we've been noticing is that uh, there is a PFM community of experts addressing PFM issues, and then it's public administration community addressing uh, those issues. And, and there, there are also experts uh, uh, addressing academics, addressing uh, change management, how to do reforms, etc. We have to bring all these experts together to actually address it from a different perspective. While the PFM uh, uh, um, experts uh, still assist countries uh, uh, in the PFM area, you have to ha- you have to consider the public administration issues, as, as I as I show here on 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 this slide. Because if we don't go ba- down to the basis, um, you can deal with public financial management, be it complex or, or, or le- relatively stage war or to no end, and you, you will have to repeat the, the exercise over and over. Thank you very much. Neil? Well, just um, two points. Um, the first is to, to Simon. Um, I, th- I think the technology that is common, that is inappropriate, is the desk. <laughs> um, and, and I would have thought that, I mean, if you're presenting budgeting in the real world, a more appropriate photograph would probably have been one in committee. Um, on, on, on the point that, uh, that was made by, by Marco, um, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether, in T, whether TA shouldn't be more underwhelming um, than overwhelming. And, and maybe the approach that should be taken is that, well, if you don't come up as a country with more than 50 percent of the des- this design of a reform, there's going to be a gap, and we're not going to make it up in TA. We're going to require the country to make up that gap um, in the design of, of the reform that is undertaken. And I think the benefit of that is that you are, you are leaving the country with a better understanding of the design, the formulation, and the implementation of, of that reform. I mean, I've, been, I've witnessed too often technical assistance being provided in a way that is, this is the reform, this is what it looks like, and this is how 
you will shift from what you're currently doing to what you will be doing when we leave now after we've provided the TA. Thanks. Yo, can you have a final word? <laughs> okay, in that case, that's left for me. Um, I think we've learned a lot about what the drivers of budget processes are. Um, as, um, as Jana said, they clearly are messy and therefore hard to tackle, but it's not as if we don't know what they are. And there's quite a lot of clarity and consensus of what actually matters, and that seems to be a good place to leave this session because that gives certainly gives some ideas about what, pri what practical priorities should be in the near future. So enjoy your lunch. Apologies ran over a little bit, but it was certainly an, an interesting discussion. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.